Right. So let's start uh, today's session on um, iron and steel industries and the instrumentation for iron and steel industries. As we have seen already, iron and steel industry, this is a integrated steel plant where we have the raw material uh, section. From the raw material section, we have the coking coal that is coming through a coke oven plant and which is coming to the blast furnace. Then we have iron ore coming on the other route, coming to the blast furnace. Then we also have a coal, which is going to pelleted pellet plant. And from this, it is going to the sinter plant. And from the sinter, uh, sintering and beneficiation, beneficiation is nothing but the iron ore, we are cleaning it for the, removing the dirt and other impurities. That is the process we normally call it as a beneficiation plant. And from this, the iron ore is coming here. And uh, sintering is basically the uh, heating, preheating. Right? And then it is coming. So all these through, we call the combination of coke, iron ore, and other, um, uh, other like limestone and other things. Uh, we call it, we call them as fluxes. This material, we normally call them as burden, burden or charge in a technical terminology. So this will be coming from top and we have the, we will see the uh, blast furnace diagram uh, in the next slide. But for the time being, let's understand the process. So the output of this blast furnace is, we normally call it as a pig iron because the basic reduction takes place from iron oxide, that is ferric oxides to iron in the blast furnace. Then it is coming from this iron. Iron is fed from here. Again, you are, you are getting some more scrap that is coming here that you are giving it to electric cock furnace. From here, we normally call it as a steel making process, right? And I, most molten iron and other uh, scrap that is coming here into electric cock furnace. Then we have a ladle furnace and we have a vacuum uh, degasser because all the gases entrapped in the molten metal all removed here. And then it is going to the, through ladle, we are pouring into the thundish of a continuous casting machine. And from con continuous casting machines, we are storing them in the form of uh, slabs, billets, or ingots. And this billet is like this kind of thing. They are all going through the secondary rolling mill uh, to uh, be shaped into different thing. So you are, you are going to a wire rod mill and are, we are going to a, another rolling mill where you are going into different products. Okay, so this is a iron making process. This is a steel making process. This is a casting process and this is a rolling process. Or we also call it as a forming process. These are the four important sections in any integrated steel plant. So now let's see the uh, iron melting part of it more in detail from the next uh, thing. Here we have uh, the melting part basically the melting section uh, is also done. This is the blast furnace, uh, which produces the molten pig iron. So here the main raw material is you have a iron ore and then coal in the form of coke. Your uh, um, coke is coming here and then limestone. So the entire thing is being fed to the uh, blast furnace. This entire thing is the mechanism how to operate uh, the uh, blast furnace. And uh, th this is one thing from here, the molten pig iron from the blast furnace coming to basic oxygen furnace, BOF, we normally call it as. We will see how a basic oxygen furnace operates. Then this is another direct reduction process where by sending the iron ore and coal, we are sending the natural gas. So this is a, there is a direct reduction uh, of, uh, you know, carbon monoxide, uh, the coke is being reacting with the iron oxide and iron, molten iron is coming to the thing. So this is another thing is electric cock furnace, which produces the molten metal. So we will also see what happens in the electric cock furnace, what happens in the basic oxygen furnace and what happens in the open hearth furnace. It's the main for a steel refining facility. Uh, basically, uh, refining the steel means the removing the gases are entrapping, relieving the stresses that are there in the molten metal. Um, 
all these things then it is coming to the continuous casting and what is happening so after the continuous casting you are uh, making them into slabs and thin slabs and uh, this is blooms and billets you also have another section which is not mentioned here the ingots we call them as ingots now here these are all uh, this is what is happening in the melting section steel melting section now we will see one by one what what happens in uh, blast furnace what happens in uh, electric oxygen furnace what happens in basic oxygen uh, furnace all these things we will see uh, in detail so this is a blast furnace where we have you know uh, the we normally call it as a burden or charge you know they are all coming with this skip cars right so the overall uh, height of the blast furnace will be of uh, nearly uh, 60 to 70 meters 6 to 7 floors of the uh, building if you take a rough idea this is the top portion this is a stack portion this is a bosch portion we call it as a and this is a hearth okay so uh, the mechanism here is we have a hot blast that is coming at the bottom we will see uh, what happens at the hot blast right then we have a molten uh, thing so if you see the entire uh, process that is happening here J just keep this diagram in mind and then we will see the next diagram what the chemical reactions take place reducing oxides of iron ore to free iron has been practiced over many years here that's exactly what so normally in steel industry where the source of iron is iron ore which is normally the oxides of many ore you call it as a hematite magnetite siderite limerite there are different names for ferric oxide fe2o3 xh2o and so the process widely used is blast furnace process only here the burden consisting of whatever is coming from the top this burden consists of a pre determined mixture of iron ore coke and fluxes fluxes we normally call it as a different silicon dioxide calcium carbonate all these we call them as fluxes it delivered by the skip car or a conveyor to the top of the furnace large quantities of hot air are forced in through these twires okay large quantities of hot air are forced into the bottom of the furnace through the twires it is called as twires although the spelling is t u y e r e s it's called as twires and up through the burden the furnace is this counter current reactor since the burden continuously moves down at, as it is reduced and as the reducing gas flows upward since the burden is constantly replenished at the top the reduced product must exit at the bottom that's exactly what happens at the bottom so the coke is the source of carbon for the reduction of the iron oxide to iron in the twires the blast of heated air is injected into the furnace it is in this area that the furnace combustion of coke takes place according to the equation as c plus half o2 co or c plus o2 co2 this reaction furnishes not only the main source of heat for the smelting operation but the reducing gas as well namely the carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide is the basic uh, reducing gas but the carbon monoxide always comes from carbon dioxide c plus o2 co2 and if you further supply more presence of carbon gives 2c plus o2 that is 2co or c plus half o2 in the absence of less oxygen we normally get carbon monoxide the inert gases and nitrogen in the air because air has a composition of 21% oxygen 79% nitrogen so the nitrogen in the air pass through the burden without significant charge changes they do however exist in the heat transfer because the heat that is given to the air is given to the incoming oxides the reaction of the carbon monoxide with the iron oxides occur in the mostly upper part of the furnace the molten iron collects at the bottom of the furnace at the bottom of the furnace and is tapped periodically through the iron notch the slag floating on the molten iron is separated by a system of weirs and is conducted through a series of troughs to mobile slog pot cars or to cooling pots adjacent to the furnace 
after damping and cooling it can be crushed for use as a low density fill and construction material we we'll just see more in detail here that's what happens in the all the chemical reactions that are taking place here so carbon dioxide plus carbon you got normally 2co the basic reduction takes place of more of carbon monoxide here because we have more of carbon and more of oxygen uh, that is coming through the air so here the whatever the carbon that is contained in the coke is coming here and whatever the oxygen contained in the air that is coming here that's exactly what happens here so 3co react the reduction of the equation is it removes the oxygen from fe2o3 that is the reason why we call it as a reduction equation and we get uh, iron uh, this is elemental uh, iron then carbon dioxide always escapes through this hot waste gases so what to do with these waste gases we will see it in the next uh, um, blast furnace stove and these hot waste gases are used to preheat the coke that is coming or the air that is coming and that hot air is again sent back here that's the, so this hot waste gases go to the uh, blast furnace stove and they heat the checkers there and this checkers will again send it through the hot air blast this will be recycling we will see that in the next diagram so this is a basic action then again the limestone is basically used to bring out the impurities in the molten iron in the form of slag so cso3 reacts into calcium oxide and co2 c calcium oxide reacts with sand again give to casio2 this is exactly what is the molten slag here that is removed continuously one molten iron in one way and the slag on the other way we will see the other thing this is the stove of the blast furnace so this is the cross section at a this is the portion cross section means you should always see it from the top you are seeing from the top okay so here you have the refractory checkers checkers are in a honeycomb fashion uh, we call it as checkers because it's like refractory bricks which are arranged in a honeycomb fashion where the combustion gases will be con continuously in touch with them so you will see here this portion is this portion and the checkers refractory is this portion okay so you have a hot blast coming here and you have a additional burner here to heat the air so this is what we are getting a cold blast means cold air is coming in this direction okay cold air is coming in this direction and hot blast is going from this to the actually uh, to your uh, blast furnace okay so this is output of the hot blast and input of the cold box so this is actually heating the checkers and through this it is going through this way to the output okay and then burner you have and here you will see this is the blast furnace gas main because whatever the waste gases that are coming from the blast furnace are coming through here they are further heated and again sent through this to the checkers so this is like a you know what happens in the blast furnace stove here is once you understand this mechanism uh, you have a for a temperature measurement you have thermocouples here and then radiation for pyrometer you will see like a cc camera in order to monitor the temperature of the dough so the major pieces of auxiliary equipment selling serving the blast furnace is the blast furnace stove so uh, this is operated in cycles normally the first cycle is one of the heat storage the second is the releasing of that heat to the cold air being blown from the bottom into the stove thus producing the hot blast blast we normally call it as a, it is a pressurized air in the first cycle the waste gas is from the blast furnace is burned with the air that is coming through here and in a combustion chamber although the waste gas is not particularly rich it is available at small capital and operating cost because it's a waste gas we are using that waste heat from the waste gas and further heating it to this particular condition the products of combustion are conducted through the chamber which is a honeycomb of refractory brick called checkers the checkers are heated by the combustion products during the second cycle the combustion system is shut down the sealed and sealed from the stove this is what happens a large quantity of cold air enters the stove 
and is heated by the checkers. It exits from the stove as the hot blast used in the furnace process. Because the cyclic nature of the stove process does not match the continuous furnace operation, most modern blast furnaces are equipped with at least three to four, if not some blast furnaces will have five to six stoves so that a continuous source of sourced hot blast is always available. The major process parameters requiring close measurement and control are the raw material proportions and weights, the temperature and volume of hot blast because there is a heat balance that is happening. Because what is the, in the blast furnace we have seen, what is the total amount of iron ore that is coming and what is the total hot air that is. You have to match the, we normally call it as a heat balance. For that, you have to closely monitor and measure the raw material proportions and weights, the temperature and volume of hot blast, the flow of cooling water in both the furnace and gas washing system, and the temperature and combustion controls for the stove. The utilities that are needed are electric power, cooling water, steam, and high volume, low pressure air from the blowers. So this is exactly what happens in a blast furnace. So this is the stove, which is mainly used for that process. Okay, so then we will see, this is a raw steel making, we normally call it as a BOF, basic oxygen furnace. So basic oxygen furnace is morely of the refining of the uh, molten thing. So you will see in the diagram here, scrap is being put into the BOF vessel and this is a hood. This is the charging floor and then charging the molten iron. We are getting this molten iron from the blast furnace. We are feeding it here and the scrap we are feeding here. So two types of inputs are scrap is nothing but what we normally see it here. And then in the third stage, we are fixing the hood and then we are lancing it with oxygen. And this is for turn down for temperature and analysis. A small sample is taken of the molten metal to see the temperature, the analysis of the sample. And then tapping into the ladle. It is poured into the ladle. Ladle is nothing but a, uh, a big bucket, uh, which will mainly use to carry the molten metal onto the, uh, you know, this is again sent for uh, making into ingots or to the continuous casting machine. So that is exactly what happens in a basic oxygen furnace. Then the next one we have is the electric cock furnace. And this electric cock furnace also, we have the uh, molten metal uh, that is coming from the blast furnace and then the scrap that is coming into the thing. So the, the, the here you will see, as we have already discussed, we have three electrodes which are positively charged and the scrap here is the negative, this is the negative electrode and this will be the positive electrodes. And these three are the graphite electrodes where we are supplying power at 10,000 amps and 11 kV voltage supply. You can imagine the wattage power rating of this. And it, the principle of operation is mainly the electric arc welding, where when there is a small gap between the positive electrode and the negative electrode, an arc is always strike, arc strikes and that arc actually melts the scrap and further refines the molten metal. So this is uh, basically for uh, using the thing. This is where we are um, uh, taking the iron, uh, molten iron and the uh, scrap and mixing them into proportions. Then this is sent as a purified steel. And this is for removal of the slag, which is there at the uh, top, you will see. And the basic operation of this, we will see in these diagrams. So an electric cock furnace looks like this. So a roof is, uh, you know, swung away here and where we are charging scrap buckets, we are charging the scrap into the thing. Then we are closing it and we are adding the flux through this. And then operated, you have all the three electrodes operating and then tilting right side, left side, you are removing the slag and uh, further refining again, again refining again, two, three stages you are refining and then you are adding whatever is added uh, you want to add because that you know, for carbon, all these things. And these alloys are tapped into the ladles and these ladles again carry into the, so this is exactly how you are uh, tilting it. 
for pouring the uh, molten iron into the ladle. So then from the ladle, we uh, bring it to the continuous casting machine. So this is here, continuous casting machine. We have uh, mostly the ladle that is here. Ladle operation again is done mostly twice, uh, two way. One is huge ladles of 50 tons and all. They are placed just on the continuous casting machine in order to get the uh, raw material into the thandish. And then we have a continuous casting machine. And here we will see how the temperature is uh, controlled. And this molten metal continuously is coming into this. And it, this is what is uh, happening because that is as it is passing through different stages, you know, it is getting cooled and how we are monitoring the temperature. This is exactly what happens in a continuous casting. Why we call it as a continuous casting means the molten metal is always uh, allowed here to fall through a orifice or nozzle. And as it carries through, these rollers are always uh, rotating. So the metal, as it passes through different rollers, goes through this. And then, they, like we will see, they are cut here at different sections in a like like here we are uh, cutting so this is again a billet reheating furnace where we are uh, reheating the billets and to a different uh, uh, temperatures and then we are uh, shaping them into them and these billets are all sent to rolling mills so this is exactly what happens in a rolling mill and this is a billet and billet are made to pass through different rollers where it is shaped into either a because a, a, as such it may be a rectangular cross section or a circular uh, or a square cross section and final output majority of the cases you may require round square circular cross section so it is made to pass through different uh, rollers in order to get the thing here again you remember this figure this is roller what we will be discussing in our pressure measurement uh, these rollers you will have on both sides and uh, how we are measuring the number one there are two measurements here one is the temperature with the drop in temperature the dc motors will be drawing more current if the more temperature is there for the billet the dc motors will draw less current because the billet will be in softened condition another thing is in order we have to uh, have some pressure sensors here which will be used to measure the softness of the steel that is coming here at every stage. So each roller is fitted here with a pressure measurement uh, uh, sensor, which acts on a magnetostrictive effect that we will see when we come to this pressure measurement here in the uh, next few, few slides. So this is exactly the um, basic process adopted. And then these are all the final outputs, what we will be getting you know, in uh, sheets, these reinforcing rods of different uh, uh, output. Then the measurement hardware is general uh, electrical instruments like ammeters, voltmeters, and uh, wattmeters. Uh, then we have temperature measurement, thermocouples, and pyrometers. So these ammeters, voltmeters, and wattmeters are all uh, will be like you know your Electric cock furnace will be using at 11 kV with 10,000 amps. That's the uh, magnitude of the current that you will be measuring compared to your laboratory ammeters where you have a microamps and milliamps. And again, here, volt voltmeters will be measuring in kilovolts and wattmeters will be measuring in kilowatts. So the temperature measurement here, you will have the most of the, the pyrometers. The temperature will be monitored through pyrometers and thermocouples and pressure measurement and flow. This we will see here. And this is the ladle, which is brought through a overhead crane and is being poured on the continuous casting machine. This is how we are seeing the thing. So this is one temperature measurement of a continuous uh, casting machine. Just try to recall the continuous casting machine, which we have just seen. And this is a refractory lining from outside. And inside and all, you have a cooling water jacket. OK, so through which cooling water will this entire thing is a circular cross section and continuously your cooling water will be uh, passed in order to bring down the temperature because inside temperature will be very hot. So that is the reason why this cooling water will come 
as it passes through this it becomes hot this hot water is again sent to the cooling towers and again the temperature is brought down in the cooling towers again it is recirculated here here the basic measurement parameter here is you see number of thermocouples 10 thermocouples which you have they are all arranged in a sequence and are connected to a self balancing potentiometer okay so this is how the thing see this is where you are maintaining the meniscus liquid metal meniscus and this is the thandi shaft the continuous casting machine if you see this this will be the height of nearly 2 uh, to 3 meters or even 5 6 meters in big continuous casting machine and you have to continuously maintain this level and the, the here you will be uh, it is will be passing through the number of rollers okay so if you see this diagram you have thermocouples arranged 1 to 10 thermocouple the output in millivolts what you are getting first three thermocouples who are here are giving less than 5 volts or uh, less than 10 volts but from 4 to 10 you will see the 4 to uh, 3 to 4 the temperature the thermocouple all this the output in millivolts continuously increases because it is suddenly coming in contact to the liquid metal so there is a huge output of the millivolts and from then onwards it is almost constant with string reducing output because as you come to the 10th thermocouple the molten metal gets solidifies and then the temperature comes down that is then slightly it is inclined towards the 10th thermocouple so the entire thing is connected in a self balancing potentiometer where you are uh, this is a balancing potentiometer and you have a set point so this set point is always set what should be the temperature of this uh, at, at this point if the outside temperature is let's say 1800 degree centigrade what should be the temperature after the cooling jacket what should be the here let's say it is 400 degree centigrade or 500 degree centigrade so there is always a direct relation between the inside liquid metal temperature and the temperature that is sensed by the thermocouples that is the set point here for the potentiometer then both of which we are giving it to an error amplifier and the the error is given to servo amplifier which is uh, moving a servo motor and that is actually adjusting the position to give a final signal of what should be the level and how much uh, metal it should be continuously coming down continue considering the this operation so this is how you will see a typical application where a group of thermocouples are used to sense or measure and monitor a liquid uh, level liquid level of molten metal here this is a one classic example of measurement then if you see this is a pressure measuring thing uh, i have just asked you to observe the rolling mill this is a typical cross section of a rolling mill you will see the high. this is a small screw and uh, you have a location of pressure sensor here uh, i hope you are observing the pressure sensor here in the rolling mill so this is a general uh, mill housing and you have these two rollers and in between this is the steel being rolled you will see here this is the diagram x and this is the diagram this is the uh, dimension y so y is always less than the x because the dimension the cross sectional here is getting reduced as the steel being rolled comes through these rollers and because of this the pressure sensor here experiences enormous you know stress and that stress has to be measured through some magnetostrictive effect that's exactly uh, is the principle so you have a screw just try to understand uh, before we understand uh, before we uh, see the principle uh, i hope the uh, construction is uh, clear you have this is a bottom bearing which is housing the rolling and this is a top bearing this is movable and bottom bearing is fixed fixed in a place and this roller is fixed whereas this roller is moving because it has to move uh, why because the steel being rolled is coming through this and unless this is made to so once it adjusts then it is fixed at one place because uh, we are applying the screw here for a given dimension so if this is of 24 mm diameter and this may be coming down to 22 mm or 20 mm to that extent reduction of diameter your pressure sensor will be ex uh, experiencing the uh, 
pressure here. So this is exactly what uh, here. So this uh, pressure sensor acts on a magnetostrictive effect of load detection. So the pressure sensor is this actually. Uh, it has a winding like this. So the magnetostrictive effect utilized by this sensor. Uh, you know, the, we are seeing it in the uh, dimension here. This is a no load flux pattern and loaded uh, flux pattern. A series of electrical steel laminations are stacked and glued together. Four holes of 90 degrees from each other are punched or bored at the stack. A primary winding is wound through two holes, you will see here, at 180 degrees apart, and a secondary is wound through the other two at 180 degrees. When the primary is excited by an AC voltage, the flux pattern of the steel is shown as we are seeing it here. You know, no load flux pattern and a full load flux pattern. Since the coils are at right angles to each other, no voltage is induced into the secondary. However, when a compressive force is placed on the lamination stack, that is the sensor top, the unloaded flux pattern is distorted because the magnetic permeability, permeability is reduced in the direction of the applied force. This is the direction of the applied force. Part of the flux now links to the secondary winding, inducing a voltage in the secondary. This effect is linear over a range of compressive forces. In fact, the load cell you would have studied, an actual load cell based on this principle would be composed of many thousands of such laminations and would be custom designed with the total load cell arranged so that the force would be evenly distributed across all the sensor laminations. Here, all these laminations are nothing but very, very, very thin uh, sheets which are stacked together. So this is how uh, the pressure is measured here from for the electrical rolling mill here. That's what uh, is the thing. Okay, so this is the pressure measurement. And then we have the, uh, the flow measurement you all, we all have studied in the second semester the orifice plate, which you are seeing it here. And you have a, a pressure taps. This is a pipe, um, a two feet pipe or three feet pipe. And uh, this is the orifice, uh, re removing the orifice. And uh, the if you see it here from side view, this is a small uh, gap here. And these are all the supporting spider to the thing. So the, these are the pressure measuring holes. And this is the annual annular surface, what we have. So the flow measurement, as we know, the, it is always the difference between the pressure, pressure difference we are getting. So the total pressure is rho g h. H is the uh, pressured head, the differential pressure that we are getting. Because whenever there is an obstruction, there is always a differential pressure compared to this. When this is connected to YouTube manometer, and there is always a differential pressure from this pressure to this pressure. And that is normally what is called as pressure head H. So rho density of the liquid, which is mercury, if it is a mercury manometer, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. And then uh, we have the head. So you will get the total pressure units. So this is how this flow measurement is used normally for the air that is coming from different blowers, how much of hot blast is going through this pipe, how much coal is moving through this pipe, coal in powder form, it is being sent through, uh, mixed with air, with hot pressure, your entire coke and uh, coal will be pushed through pulverized coal, we normally call it as. So whether it is water or air or pulverized coal or hot air, all these are sent, uh, we, we are using the orifice plate for flow measurement. And that's precisely what is uh, the total process description and the measurement hardware involved in the iron and steel industry. 